It is always a pleasure to be with the brethren at Bellevue. This, this congregation has a very special place in our heart. <clears throat> My mentor was W.R. Bill Craig, who in his very young preaching days, back in probably the mid-1940s or late 40s, he preached in Pensacola. And uh, uh, Brother Gallagher here was uh, some of his kinfolks. And so Bellevue does have a special place in my heart and in Charlene's heart. You were all so, so good to us uh, during these uh, lectureships, uh, so very kind. The whole congregation, all of the members uh, to feed us. And uh, uh, if, if I get so fat that my doctor gives me bad marks, then you shall not be held guiltless. <laughs> but it is a it's a joy to be here and a, a pleasure to be with you in this gospel effort <clears throat> more than a century before the Chaldeans besieged Jerusalem laid it waste destroyed Solomon's temple took Judah captive Isaiah prophesied that Judah would return to their land after this was over. And his prophecy is one of the most remarkable in the Old Testament because he calls the name of the Persian king who would allow Judah to return to her land after their captivity. In Isaiah 44, verses 24 and 28, the scripture says, Thus saith the Lord, that saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Now, I, uh, that king, Cyrus, issued his decree in 2 Chronicles, or it's recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verses 22 and 23. And that's in the last chapter of 2 Chronicles. In the first chapter of Ezra, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 3, we have an identical uh, account of the decree of King Cyrus, who was the king of Persia, who allowed Judah to go home. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord might be accomplished, uh, spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Judah's return to their land wasn't a matter of all right, everyone, pack up and go home. <clears throat> it wasn't a matter of a, a, a one-time thing, and it certainly wasn't uh, that all the Jews went back. Judah's return to their land took place in three different expeditions, and it was over a period of about 100 years that the return took place. The return, of course, is chronicled in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah with the events of Esther being contemporary with the events in the book of Ezra. Contemporary 
with that expedition's return. Now, the return of the first expedition to the land of Judah is the subject of the book of Ezra. And Cyrus gave those returnees the items which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple. Now, if you're looking along in Ezra, the book of Ezra, in Ezra chapter 1, verse 11, it says, those items numbered 5,400. You see, there were uh, so many items from the temple that were sacred, that were valuable, uh, that the Chaldeans had taken and captured, and they destroyed the temple. But these things were necessary for the service of the Levites in the temple. The items they needed for worship, there were, uh, w with the items they needed for worship, which were these things from the temple, there were 42,360 Jews and 7,337 servants and their maids that began their journey home. That's found in Ezra chapter 2, verse 2, and verses 64 and 65. Their sole task was to rebuild the temple at Jerusalem. They were in a state of restoration, a period of restoration. That's what we call this, the period of restoration in the history of the Jews. Restored to their land. God had made uh, promises to Abraham that in his seed would all nations of the earth be blessed. That was the prophecy of Christ. That he would make of him a great nation, which he did in the womb of Egypt, and then called them forth. And he said he would give his seed the land over which Abraham walked, which he did. And he also, through his prophets, said that uh, those people would go into captivity, which they did. And he had also prophesied they would be restored to their land, which they were. Every prophecy regarding the Jews has been fulfilled. And this idea that the Jews will be restored to their land when Christ comes again, is not so. God's already fulfilled that promise. And he fulfilled that promise in, uh, uh, that's what we're studying about now, beginning in the book of Ezra. They were to be rebuild the temple at Jerusalem, and some of the chief of the fathers, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to set it up in his place. That's in Ezra chapter 2 verse 68. They were in a time of restoration. I submit to you that we are in a sense <clears throat> in that same time today. Now I realize the church has been restored on the North American continent. <clears throat> but so many congregations and far too many in our time have fallen away from the faith. All you have to do is surf the internet and look at the various websites of so-called churches of Christ. And you can't tell the difference between them, the United Methodist Church or the Presbyterian Church USA, or Baptist churches, or community churches, because they are teaching and practicing so many of the same things. The church today is in a, if not a restoration period, a transition period, when we must restore the respect for the scriptures into the minds of people again today. And there was a time in our country, and you who know restoration history know this, in the 19th century, when uh, uh, great and good men called people back to the old Jerusalem gospel, calling them out of denominationalism. 
And uh, that uh, movement swept across the country until men had restored the church that you read about in the New Testament. And then, toward the end of that century, division came. And ultimately, the Christian church arose out of that because they adopted the unscriptural practice of instrumental music, mechanical instrumental music, Terry. Uh, and they adopted the missionary society. And from those two small steps, a, a, uh, an error in the worship of the church and an error in the work of the church, from those two initial steps, the Christian church today is a full-blown denomination belonging to the devil. Amen. So is the conservative Christian church. Just like all denominations. Now, in our time, something similar has happened. We have people today who have departed from the faith. And oh, you're going to hear people raise a loud, loud cry when I say this. Because I've had them tell me that I was absolutely wrong. But we have men, churches today, who have compromised the truth. They may not teach error, but they have compromised with error. Amen. And among those, the leaders in those, the Southside Church in Lubbock, Texas, the Memphis School of Preaching, Forest Hill in Nashville, Tennessee, a number of other congregations, Bear Valley, in Denver, Colorado. Shirts in San Antonio, Texas. And you could go on and on. And those people are compromising with error. And I'm probably going to get chastised. <sighs> I don't care. But we are in a situation today where those of us who constitute the remnant of God's people are going to have to be strong. We are going to have to restore respect for the scriptures. We're going to have to restore respect for the authority of Jesus Christ and we are going to have to restore respect for scriptural, biblical fellowship. So we are, we are in a sense in the, same, in the same situation somewhat that the people were in Ezra's day. They were restoring something. They were going to restore the temple. And so the first thing they did was to erect an altar and lay the foundation for the temple. Zerubbabel was an ancestor of Jesus Christ. He was of the tribe of Judah. He led the first wave of returnees in the book of Ezra. And the priest, Jeshua, was in that company as well. And their purpose, that company's purpose, was to rebuild the temple in Ezra 2 and verse 2, which came uh, uh, says that they came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Realiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpar, Bigvi, Rehum, Bena. They came, and they came to build the temple at Jerusalem. And in the seventh month after their return, they built the altar of burnt offerings and offered morning and evening sacrifices as required in the law of Moses, according to chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 of Ezra. So the worship has been restored. 
The seventh month was come. The children of Israel in the cities gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as written in the law of Moses, the man of God. as written in the law of Moses. They're following the scriptures. They're following the law, as they should. Their, their, their acts of, rec, of restoration are being conducted as they should have been conducted. This they did, by the way, in the midst of hostile people who surrounded them. <clears throat> They had some uh, very hostile people that surrounded them. Um, they, they set up the, the uh, altar. They built the altar. They set up the altar upon his basis. Verse 3 of Ezra 3, For fear was upon them because of the people of those countries, and they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord even burnt offerings, morning and evening. They were in the midst of hostile people. There has never been a time in the world when the world surrounding God's people was not hostile to them. And this is no less true of our day. People who surround us are hostile to us. The denominations are hostile to us. Some, de <laughs> some denominations are not as hostile to us as our own so-called brethren in some congregations around us. I don't know if I ever told you this or not, but uh, I was, uh, we got information. You know, I was here last uh, October. Shirley and I came, and we held a gospel meeting, and it was a, it was a good meeting. And... Uh, for a good church. We get back to Oklahoma, a friend informs Charlene that someone here, and it wasn't someone at Bellevue, it was probably someone in Florida, happened to see this and called uh, a preacher, Dale Royal, I'll call his name, in Elk City, uh, who preaches there because uh, they'd heard I was from Elk City and thought maybe he knew me. Well, he does know me. But if you will ask him about me, he won't say anything good about me. And so I was, uh, uh, I was raked over by him to this woman in Florida, or wherever she came from. But uh, the point I'm making is that our own so-called brethren will rake us over. They will rake us over. Uh, Sometimes our own so-called brethren are more hostile to us than outside forces. And the Apostle Paul said, I know that after my departing to the Ephesian elders, Acts 20, after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing your flock. They're going to come in from the outside. Then he said, also from among your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. The Lord's people, the faithful, the remnant, always has enemies, both within and without. Jesus told his apostles that if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. John 15, 18, and 19. And at one point Jesus said, the servant is not above his master. Let me tell you, it doesn't bother me to be hated in the service of the Lord. Now, it would bother me to be hated for some other reason. But if people hate me because I'm serving Christ, I don't care. 
I just really don't care. I had a preacher several years ago in Elk City who told me, he said, Jerry, I'm afraid that, that the articles you're writing are going to, is going to hurt you with the brethren around here. And I said, I don't care. I don't care if it hurts me with the brethren around here. Those brethren are not my judge. Jesus Christ is. And we have to, we have to stand for what is right. And Jesus said, if you do, they're going to hate you. But remember this, the service is not above his master. They crucified our master. They haven't crucified me yet. Probably won't like he was. But if they did, the servant's not above his master. They crucified him. The builders laid the foundation of the temple amidst hostility. And Jesus said the world hates us because we are not of this world. He told Pilate in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate knew what a kingdom was. He worked for one, the Roman kingdom. He knew what a worldly kingdom was, and he knew the power of a worldly kingdom. And Jesus told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not like the Roman kingdom. My kingdom is not like the one you work for. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. And Pilate understood that. Pilate understood it. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. And his people are not of this world. We are in the world, but not of the world. The kingdom is in the world, but it's not of the world. That's exactly what Jesus meant. The builders laid the foundation of the temple with the priests and the Levites praising God and giving thanks for his mercy. And Ezra 3.11 says, And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the Lord was laid. But that day was filled with mixed emotions. Ezra 3.12 and 13 says, But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice. And many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. Can you imagine some people just shouting, this is the most wonderful thing we've seen? This younger generation, the younger people, They'd never seen anything like this. This is wonderful. And then there, are the, then there are the men who are standing over here who are about Gene Hill's age and Doug McLeish's age, Terry Hightower's age, and they're saying, it's not like the original, not like the one we remember. Now, they were young when they went into captivity. Now they're the older men. But they remember that other temple. This is not like the old temple. It's not like Solomon's temple. It's beautiful. It's not like Solomon's. And you know, I see that, and, and I've, I've made that application in our day where we live. When I was a, a little boy in western Oklahoma, the church was strong. The preaching was powerful. People were baptized in 1952. One little country church among uh, whom was my grandfather, 25 people were baptized. We haven't baptized 25 people since we started the congregation 20 years ago. But in that one, and that was during one gospel meeting, 25 people baptized. The church was strong there. I remember great and sound men, Horace Busby used to preach down, he'd come and preach at Altus. Oklahoma, south of us. I heard, I heard Leroy Brownlow preach a gospel meeting. I heard Foy Wallace. I was with Wallace, uh, Brother Wallace in about two or three meetings. J.T. Marlin preached there. V.E. Howard preached there. Great men preached there, and I heard them. 
and they're gone. They're gone. And there are a small remnant of a handful of churches in western Oklahoma that are still faithful. And this old man weeps at that. The younger people may say, whoa, this is really good. But this old man weeps. It's not what it once was. But brethren, we mustn't give up hope and we must never quit. I will preach the gospel to the day I die. And I hope that when I die, I've just extended the invitation to somebody. I don't have to extend the invitation today, do I? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we must never quit. We must never give up. We have, we have some restoring to do. Just like the Jews under, uh, under Zerubbabel did. Now, this restoration is going on, but the enemies are opposing it. Look at, look at Ezra 4, 1 and 2. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the, uh, of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. Does that sound familiar? God and Allah are the same thing. Sounds like that, doesn't it? Which, of course, is a lie. Allah is not God. He is a God. He's a false God. He's a figment of somebody's imagination. But Allah is not a real, a real thing. Allah is an it. Jehovah God, our God, is the living God. And these people, they come to Zerubbabel and they say, we want to help you build because we're seeking God just like you do. For since we sacrifice unto him, since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Asher, which brought us up hither, the proposal to let us build with you did not come from a friendly disposition. These people were what the scripture describes them. They were adversaries of the Jews and their intent was to thwart the work of restoration. They didn't intend to, to do any good or to help. Zerubbabel and the others wisely replied, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Ezra 4.3, we're going to do what King Cyrus commissioned us to do. We're building the house of the Lord. He didn't commission you to do it. He commissioned us to do it. God has always, always demanded a separation of his people. We are today, the church, called a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness. 1 Peter 2, 9, and Paul wrote, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Ephesians 5, 11. These adversaries of the Jews practiced a form of Judaism, a corrupted form of Judaism. Denominations in our day practice a form of Christianity, but it's a corrupted form of Christianity. Denominations are no more interested in aiding us in the work of the church then these Samaritans were interested, or the adversaries of the Jews were interested in aiding them. Their adversaries and today's denominations were and are the agents of the devil, whose aim is to destroy God's work. Every denomination upon the face of the earth 
is a tool of the devil. There is not a single one God approves. They are all the devil's institutions. They are all the children of Satan. Every denomination that claims to follow Jesus Christ. And their intent is to destroy God's work. The Jews' adversaries <clears throat> were a uh, they were a mongrel race of people. In uh, 2 Kings chapter 17, we read how these people came about. They were a mongrel race of people known in the New Testament as the Samaritans. Now the Jews would go all the way around Samaria when they were going from the south up to the north to Galilee. They hated the Samaritans so much they wouldn't even go through their land. The same was true, I think, right after World War II. Dutch people would not travel through Germany. They hated the Germans so much. Well, the Samaritans were a mongrel race of people. Their religion was a mixture of Judaism and heathen practices they were descended from the Jews who had intermarried with heathen inhabitants of the land after the northern tribes were carried away into Assyrian captivity. And the king of Assyria populated that land, brought in heathen who intermarried with the Jews that were left there. And so their religion was a mixture of Judaism and heathen practices, and that's why the Jews hated them. And that's precisely the nature of today's denominational religion. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 17, beginning verse 24, it says, The king of Assyria brought men from Babylon, from Cutha, and from Ava, from Hamath, from Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof, and so it was, the beginning of their dwelling there, they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, uh, thou, uh, uh, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence, and let them go dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Well, let's get one of the priests that we got out of Israel and send him back there and let him kind of fill them in. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. But now this is not a priest that's ordained of God. This is one of the kind of priests that were set up by Jeroboam at the division of the kingdom when he set up his golden calf for them to worship. He said, you don't have to go down to Jerusalem. And he made priests of the basest sort of people. How be it every nation made gods of their own, verse 29, and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, Every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt, and the men of Babylon made Succoth Benoth, and the men of Cuth made uh, uh, Nergal, and the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak, and the Sepharvites uh, uh, burnt their children in fire to Adramelech and Anamelech, the gods of Sepharvaim. So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves the lowest of, the, of them priests in the high places which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. I want you to notice in verse 31, it said the Avites made Nibhaz 
and Tartak. These are gods. And the, it says, the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak and the Sepharvites burnt their children in fire to Adramalek and Anamalek, the gods of Sepharvaim. What were they doing? They were sacrificing their children. They were placing them into this metal thing that was in the arms of this, this idol, had fire in it, burning their children. Take the babies there and burn them. Can you imagine that? Would you take your baby and burn it? No. Decent people wouldn't do that. But they were sacrificing their babies to their God. There is no difference in what they did and what abortionists are doing today. Amen. They are sacrificing babies in the womb to the false God of choice. They are burning their children in the fire to choice. And there is no difference. So that's what the Samaritans were. Descended from Jews who had intermarried with heathen. They were a mongrel spiritual race. Mingling truth with men's doctrines and opposing the true religion. They were rebuffed by Zerubbabel. But uh, uh, when they were rebuffed by Zerubbabel, the Samaritans turned to legal means to oppose the Jews' work, so they hired counselors against them. The work was stopped. Uh, all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, and continued to the reign of Darius, Ezra 4 and 5. We're going to have to skip on down. When Ezra came to the land later, Ezra himself came later. The three expeditions were led by Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Zerubbabel and Ezra's are recounted in the book of Ezra. Nehemiah's, of course, in the book of Nehemiah. When Ezra arrived at Jerusalem, he was met with some very grave news. The princes informed him that people hadn't separated themselves from the heathen and they practiced idolatry, and they intermarried with the heathen around them. This was the very thing that led to their captivity more than 70 years ago. Doing the same thing. They never learned, did they? Well, look at the church today. We have a division today. People never learn. And they said the hand of the princes and rulers has been chief in this trespass. Ezra plucked his hair and his beard. He sat down astonished at their transgressions. And he prayed. He rose up in his mantle and garment, which he had rent. He fell upon his face, spread out his hands to God, and prayed a prayer of confession. Oh, my God, I'm ashamed to blush, to lift up my face to thee. Behold, we are before thee in our trespass, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. Ezra 9, 15. He immediately instituted reforms after he was told uh, about this, after he learned of this great trespass, after Shechaniah admitted their sin in taking strange wives, and they promised to put them away along with the children. Ezra 10, 2 through 5, and 9 through 17. Those reforms need to be closely studied in the cases of unlawful marriage among Christians today. Ezra said, you've transgressed. You've taken strange wives. You have to separate yourselves from the people of the land and from strange wives. And they didn't protest. They just said, well, let it be done orderly. And it was. <coughs> the separation took place. God doesn't demand that we marry only Christians today, but he does demand that when we marry, it is one man and one woman for life with only one cause that he approves for divorce, and that is fornication. 
marriages that are not approved of God. And two people divorce, not for a scriptural reason, but because they just want a divorce, and they both remarry somebody else, they're both in a state of adultery. And they cannot please God in that state. If they want to become Christians and go to heaven, they're going to have to leave that adulterous state. The same principle applies there that applied in Nehemiah's day. Gospel preachers today can't ignore that, saying, well, uh, they're just too widespread, or so many in the church are in that situation, and we can't ex expect people to uh, break up their homes. And uh, I think it's Buster Dobbs made the statement a few years ago, arguing against dissolving adulterous marriages, saying it put them in an untenable position. I'm sure Jesus was in a pretty untenable position when he was scourged and taken to the cross. <clears throat> if the marriage is unlawful in the eyes of God, it has to be dissolved, and that's the message Chris, uh, preachers ought to convey. Things written four times in the book of Ezra are valuable to all Christians in our century. Malachi recorded in Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I change not. God is unchangeable and unchanging and unchanged. And his law of marriage established in the beginning is as valid today as it was in Genesis. No one today can repent and remain in an adulterous marriage. And that's one of the lessons we learned from the book of Ezra. Thank you. That was a good study, and he talked about getting reprimanded for some of the things they said. Well, not from here. You might get it from someplace else, but it won't be from here. It's sad that many of our brethren today are going back and now then accepting this denominational group of the Christian church. And some in, if I can use the term, high places, uh, that they are our brethren. Now, they, at least they'll recognize them brethren in error. Well, no, they're not our brethren. They joined a denominational group, they, and they're not our brethren. Christian church is not the Lord's church. Now, when it first took place, that division, you might have been able to say they were brethren then. But they had become a denomination. Those people who were baptized into that group had never been baptized into the Lord's church. We appreciate that lesson, Brother Jerry. We're going to stand dismissed for about 10 minutes and then need to be back in for Brother Terry Hightower's lesson. <clears throat>